Welcome to Expert Opinion. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we live and work today. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Expert Opinion is brought to you by Campus Morning Mail, Australia's most read higher education publication and Twig Marketing. Today, we're bringing you a sneak preview of insights from a panelist at this week's conference, which is Are You Ready Australia? The Future of Indigenous Leadership in Australian Higher Education. And we've got Professor Bindi Bennett, who is clearly an emerging leader in the sector and has worked at the University of Sunshine Coast, Bond, and also her current home at ACU, where she's currently working on a whole range of projects Bindi, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> now, four weeks ago, the ARC announced that um, you would be leading a team at ACU, which will be looking at ways to enhance the skills of social work and allied health graduates to be culturally responsive by engaging students in an Aboriginal-based virtual reality program. Now, where did the idea from for the this uh, project come from? Um, actually, it probably came from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that I've worked with over a long time. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but a lot of our students have to do at least 500 hours in their third and fourth years in the field, going out to do a practicum. And um, as part of my last ARC grant, when I was looking at how to increase cultural responsiveness for those students, a lot of the organisations I was talking with were saying, we're just really exhausted by the amount of students that come. And then they, they don't really stay necessarily in rural and remote communities either. Um, but I also had a lot of organisations talk about the fact that they were shocked that a lot of students didn't have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander educators, academics, to teach them and then they also didn't know anybody Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and then they hadn't had any practicum experience either so sometimes they were coming out into positions with no experience with anyone Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander at all so they sort of said could we look at fixing that so this idea started to grow from that. Is it one? Did you resist it initially? Is it is it the challenge of well how do we replicate um, you know a real world experience and package it up into a program that will really mean something for students? I didn't fight it because it was um, announced that it was a good idea to me by, by the actual communities. So we actually have a governance group of rural and remote elders from across Western Australia and Central Australia who are actually already um, talking and helped create this grant. So they were saying they wanted it and they were saying they thought it would be useful and they were saying it could be exciting. I personally didn't know anything about it. I have to admit I'm a little bit old and <laughs> in my mind perhaps. So for me, it was a learning journey of what it could look like. And it still is because obviously we're going to co-design and we actually have um, an organisation coming on that's um, partly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander owned to help us create that as well. So we have a lot of voices to create it um, and the conversation was really Tim that it's better to have something than nothing we would rather have students have some immersion have some experience have some mistakes before they come into a community than nothing at all so I think the idea is it may not be perfect and absolutely probably won't be but it will be better than having students graduate with no experience and no uh, knowledge and no uh, values around it at all and do you envisage that there'll be students with with those special goggles on, uh, sort of, you know, walking <laughs> through remote communities so, or navigating yeah, we, their way to the it depth sounds, and depth? Sounds it's very fun. We absolutely will have some goggles, yes. We also will have, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but it's sort of like playing a game. So there'll be parts of it that'll be game-based. And if anybody's ever done Minecraft or anything similar, well, it'll be a little bit better than that because we have, you can be a person and the other person can be a virtual person. And there'll be role plays. You can talk to someone, get things right, get things wrong, talk about protocol, but we absolutely will have goggles. And we'll have, this will go through six universities where we'll pilot it and we'll actually be able to then modify it even more. So um, the idea is that you will get to talk to someone, maybe um, not in real life, but in, that has actually 
um, talked about what you need to know to come into these kind of communities and what that will look like. So yes, it's going to be a bit fun to be able to see that, get to that. But before we get to that, we have to co-design. That's our major conversation for the first year and a half is to actually go out and make sure that the community's voices are represented properly and that we actually get it as good as we can get it. Yes, absolutely. And so how long to, until students start strapping on the goggles? It'll be our third year of the grant that will run six months of piloting across six universities. So we're looking at early 2025, I would think that we're getting the goggles. And um, luckily the um, grant covers the goggles, so no one has to pay for them because they're very expensive. So that'll Absolutely. be another fun thing is that that will stay with the universities that are piloted. So they get to then have a resource which they can use for this, which we hope they will, but they might also use for other things. I think the other conversation, I'm not sure if you've seen a lot of the, um, I mean, things are changing in the world and a lot of our students are international students who may or may not know about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, but a lot of our students are also mature age students and a lot of them actually have to work. So having that 500 hours is actually a massive for people financially, emotionally, spiritually. So being able to take some of those hours off and have this as an extra or program that they can do instead of a designated amount of hours, which we in social work did as part of COVID and many other professions did, is actually going to change the field in some ways and change education, but also assist our people coming in to get degrees. And that's a little bit exciting for me that we can think of things in a different way that is going to hopefully take some of that burden off people as well as make them culturally responsive. So win-win. Absolutely. So <laughs> this relates um, quite closely in a lot of ways to, to some of your other work. You wrote a piece uh, that came out last year, which with the title was um, quite extraordinary and eye-catching, being an Aboriginal academic, it's like the Hunger Games. Now, in that article, you talked about um, some of the challenges and, and extra responsibilities that come from being an Indigenous academic in Australia when uh, the article was saying there's around 430 academics uh, across uh, universities in Australia, in, uh, that's as in 2020. Um, and, and being uh, a, such a small number, especially when you break that down into fields, you become a rare commodity and, and sometimes stretched in too many directions. Can you tell us a bit more about, you know, what led to you writing that article and a couple of others that, you know, I thought were really fascinating? Well, <clears throat> I did say to you, I, I do feel exactly that. I think that the... Academia for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can be quite violent, and it can be violent because of the systemic racism. It's a westernised neoliberal organisation, we all know that, and it has rules and ways of doing things. But even to get, quite frankly, to get to Year 12 is amazing. Then to get to university and get a degree is amazing. To actually get into academia is and start to get PhDs and those kinds of things is actually um incredible in that way so it actually takes a lot of persistence and commitment and energy just that but you're often then very isolated and you become in some ways othered you know you become the diversity person the person everybody goes to for advice um, the person everybody wants to be on every single committee that there is to tick the diversity Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander box we were just um, saying the other day that three quarters of our staff at ACU are sort of engaged in all of the committees because there's so few of us. So we just roll from committee to committee to meeting to meeting to, oh, you're here again and you again um, because there's so few of us. But that comes at a cost. But we also have to have our governance, you know, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and elders and friends and peoples and colleagues that we're constantly trying to talk to, get advice from, have support from as well. And that actually takes time. And I was saying to someone, for me to go into the community and get this kind of a grant, that's three years of work before I even started to work on that grant to get the relationships, to have the trust, to do good work. It takes a lot longer for us to do our research and get our results than a non-Indigenous person. So that's quite 
um, difficult. The other thing I said to people is when we go for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander grants, a lot of people say to us, oh, it's so much easier because there's less of you. But I'm competing with the best of the best. If you look at the people I'm competing with, and I shouldn't name drop, but there's quite a few amazing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scholars out there. I'm competing with them. So getting a grant in this space is actually, well, I was pretty lucky, um, but also pretty amazing because there are so many of us that are great. It's not like we're going against 400 people. That's a lot of people, but a lot of them aren't the best of the best. In our field, <laughs> there's 400 of us competing and of that, 150 are the best of the best, if that makes sense. So um, a lot of people talk to me about, oh, um, it's not that competitive. It's not that hard. I actually think it's double competitive and double hard <laughs> in that way. Um, and also then you were competing also against our peers of non-Indigenous people who are getting these grants, it seems pretty easily. And then we're like, well, why aren't you? Well, because it's taking me three years to even get to an idea, let alone be able to do good research with good governance. Yeah, so it is It is pretty much, if you've seen the Hunger Games, it is, and if you haven't, go and have a look and you, it's a pretty, pretty uh, clear conversation for me. So this is not really reading as a great sort of job advertisement, come and work in higher <laughs> education, but, 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 but I am thinking that what you will have seen for, by going through this process and lasting to this point, you know, you're now a professor, you've been in the system, in uh, the university system for a long time, you will have seen things that could change that make the system work better for Aboriginal people. Sort of. I think the ad is not that it's easy because nothing, I don't think there's a lot of jobs out there for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are easy, actually. And I don't think that we expect easy. It, the, the idea is to transform things and to be that um, continuum between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and voices and trying to de-Westernise and maybe re-Indigenise or, or make those opportunities for changes in knowledge, changes in skills, changes in values. So I guess that's why I've been so passionate about cultural responsiveness. So my job is um, I have been gifted um, an easy -er time in academia because of all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that have been there before me and paved the way. So my job is to make that even easier for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people following me. So that's not necessarily an easy task or a joyful task all the time. It certainly does have its joys. I think watching our students go across the stage successfully and then go out and become amazing people is always exciting. But it is a purposeful and necessary role, if that makes sense, to be able to really start to um, address inequity and and try to get more voices and equality and social justice and self-determination and sovereignty and all those good things that we want. Um, and I say, and lots of other people have said this before me, if we can get it right for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we can probably get it right for most minorities and people with lots of inequalities and intersectionalities. Um, and in fact, that's my other conversation is how do we do that? How do we widen participation within higher education because we do need to do that. Bindi, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I uh, think we need to wind it up there, but I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, taking the conversation forward with you later in the week when we yes. come back for to discuss this in greater detail and and, and hear more about the, the lessons and that you've found, the insights that you have, because I think there's some really interesting topics there to discuss. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.